Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to gather. It's exciting to be able to gather uh, like we are tonight for the purpose of hearing a testimony of how God has been working in the lives of individuals, drawing people to himself to be a part of his glorious family and a part of the kingdom of God. This is exciting. It's a privilege of ours tonight to be able to hear nine testimonies from individuals who want to be baptized and also become some of those becoming members at the church here. Each one has a conversion testimony, a conversion account that is unique to them. Each one has heard and responded to God's call in a different set of circumstances, but they've had to respond in obedience to God. This is an exciting thing. This is a unique and a personal work of God in the lives of each individual. And we can testify the same, those who know Christ, who have turned to God and are walking with him today. What a blessing is ours. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we are grateful for the work that you do in drawing individuals to yourself. You have not left us to ourselves. We would be left to self-destruct. But rather, you have shown the way of life, eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel, which sets free those who will receive it and believe it by faith. We're grateful for each individual who has committed their way to you and who wants to show and demonstrate their faith through this act of obedience and baptism. We thank you for the symbol that it represents of their dying to themselves and being raised to new life in Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would do a work, that you would stir in the hearts and minds of each one present here tonight, and that you would show yourself strong by drawing many more unto yourself, building your kingdom, building your church, even as you have faithfully promised to do. We are grateful, Lord, to be a part of it in some small way. Bless our time here tonight. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Those who are going to be sharing here tonight will be expressing their interaction with the redemptive work of Jesus. What they personally have experienced of this redemptive work. We know that as each individual's experience with the Lord is unique, some resist longer than others, don't they? Some resist long. Some come very quickly and with few trials. God is gracious. Some individuals have to wade through some very deep waters while others are seemingly carried across the depths. There are those who wrestle against God until they experience a dramatic deliverance. And yet others yield themselves consistently over the course of time from a young age on and discover a gradual adoption of the truths that they have heard which lead to life no less new. God is unique in the way that he draws and works in the life of each individual. And that's what we're going to hear here tonight in these testimonies. There are, however, some common threads woven throughout God's unique drawing of each individual. And I'd like to share with you a few of those this evening. Common thread number one, sin convicts and separates us from God. That's a common thread for each testimony we're going to hear tonight. Each of these individuals recognized that there was a need inside of them that they could not meet themselves. And if you're sitting here tonight, you know exactly what that's about. Whether you've accepted Christ or not, you recognize that when it comes to a holy, perfect God, you and I do not measure up. And we're in serious trouble unless we find some way to deal with that sin, that guilt that burdens us. So what does it look like when we recognize that sin convicts us and separates us from God? Well, it looks different for different individuals. In Acts chapter 9, we read about Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus to imprison 
possibly kill the Christians that he would find there. He had a real problem with the Christians. But this Saul of Tarsus did, thinking he was doing God a service. In the service of God, he was going to go and arrest Christians. But he had a direct encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is, as we were speaking about earlier, this is one of those dramatic transformations. Someone who was wholly, completely committed to work against God, now was transformed. And as much as he worked against God, this Saul of Tarsus, now becoming Paul the Apostle, he, he was absolutely transformed and put all the same energy he put before against God toward the church and for the service of God now. What a remarkable transformation. Now, it would be very easy for you and I. It would be very, maybe even preferable for us if everyone who shared a testimony shared a testimony like Paul, right? Wouldn't it be great if it was such a stark contrast from before to after that it was, I mean, there was never any doubt that anyone could ever have, right? You'd never question it. I was speaking to a brother recently and he mentioned to me, he said, if, if you're attacked by a bear, uh, you'll know. Like, you would notice if you were attacked by a bear. You'd probably have some visible evidence. And so they were suggesting, well, this is, when you have contact with Jesus Christ, it's like you're attacked by a bear. It'll be noticeable. Well, uh, I agree. But in some cases, it's more noticeable than in other cases. Right? As far as the dramatic experience. Certainly, the transformation from death to life is absolutely dramatic. But sometimes the evidence carries itself out in different ways. It expresses itself in differing ways. In Saul's case, dramatic transformation. But then we have those who fall under conviction based on the scriptures. And they see and understand the truth of the scriptures. In many cases, you think about this generation that grows up now in our homes being Christian homes, raising your children to fear the Lord. They're familiar with the scriptures. They know the truth. They've sat under the teaching of the word for years, all their lives. And there's a gradual just accepting of those truths, believing it to be true, eventually it, it becoming personal. And it does a transformative work in them, although not quite as dramatic as you might expect from Paul. In Acts chapter 2, sorry, rather, Acts chapter 8, verse 35, we hear about Philip the Evangelist. He was caught up by the Spirit and taken off to a fellow, an Ethiopian eunuch, traveling in the wilderness, and he was reading the book of Isaiah. He was reading the scriptures. So Philip is brought by the Spirit to where he is, gets up on the cart there with him, and asks him, hey, do you have any idea what you're reading? Does it make sense to you? And the eunuch says, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? How could I understand it? So in Acts 8, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture where he was reading in Isaiah and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And we know that the eunuch was baptized. Now, what we do not read about in this account was that there was this heavy burden and guilt on him. Obviously, he recognized he had a need. And he found that need met in Jesus. But he heard the scriptures and he believed what he heard to be true. And he received it by faith. And he was baptized. Wonderful. It's a very short account. That's all we read. We don't know what happened from there. But this eunuch might have been the way that the gospel made its way back to Ethiopia. Sometimes it's a real sense of conviction for your sins. It's a weight, a heavy weight upon you that you want to be released from. That's a conviction of sin. And we see that in Acts chapter 2. Pentecost had just taken place. The Holy Spirit came upon Peter, the other apostles, those in the upper room. And there were 3,000 who heard the word preached, who were baptized upon hearing the gospel, the truth about Jesus Christ. 
and were received by the church. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, 37, it says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So it was the preaching of the word, very direct. Peter said, while he's preaching, Jesus Christ was crucified by you, by you, <laughs> your hands. And friends, receive that for yourself. You and I bear responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He died on account of your sin and mine. So we could well be one of these 3,000. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted of their sin. It was a weight upon them. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Well, there was a ready answer. Believe and be baptized. And so they were. Those 3,000 were saved. So the first common thread is that sin convicts and separates us from God. The second common thread is that Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. Do you remember those years in school working on your math problems? Now, we know right off the bat that math is a problem. It's a problem that has not yet been solved. <laughs> but there is a solution for most problems, and we need to learn how to find them. Well, there is a sin problem, and I want to tell you and make it very clear that there is a solution to the sin problem. But many struggle in many ways to get the wrong answer. They come to the wrong conclusion in dealing with their sin. They turn to the wrong thing for the answer. Some will turn to drugs. Some will turn to drink. Some will turn to their work. Some will bury their problems and their guilt in busyness of other things. Some will turn to, to immoral sexual relationships. Some will turn to any number of things. You name it. Some will make themselves king of their lives. And it's all about them. People turn different places for solutions. But there is only one solution to our sin problem. And that is what these individuals tonight have discovered. And that's the testimony that you're going to hear tonight. Continuing in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 41. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Friends, Jesus is the answer to your sin problem. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, think about all the things that they first had to do to show that they really, really, really meant it. They had to receive his word. They had to receive his word. Do you know how you receive the word? Well, I mean, you may say right now, you're receiving my word, you may hear it. But just hearing doesn't mean you actually listen, does it? We've heard many, many things over and over and over again. How many times have you not heard the truth presented, but you haven't actually listened to it and received it? These individuals heard and received the truth. And based upon that, they believed and were baptized, added to the church, born again, received the gift of eternal life, life forever. Your friends, here we sit. We're alive and we're glad. But life hasn't yet begun. Life has not yet begun. Real life, eternal life. That's still coming. That's the promise and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Common thread number two, we find that Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. 
Common thread number three, and this will be the last one. When you've yielded to Jesus Christ, you've been baptized in obedience upon faith, confession of your faith. When you're born again, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's something unique about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does something in you to make you more like who? More like Jesus Christ. He's the Holy Spirit. Guess how he wants you to act? Holy. That's kind of, it's kind of in the name. It gives it away, right? The Holy Spirit. He's going to lead you into holiness. Not into unholiness. So that's why it's a legitimate question when individuals yield their lives to Jesus Christ. They get baptized upon the confession of their faith. They claim to know the Lord. They name the name of the Lord, but then they live like the devil. And you'd think, if anything, they were demon-possessed instead of Holy Spirit-possessed. There's legitimate reason to question those actions. Now, we're all going to grow. And it takes time for us to mature. The Holy Spirit will do its work. But it's very good for each and every one of you and I, each and every one of us, that God doesn't do His complete work all at once. Could you handle it? I couldn't handle it. Can you imagine if you were perfect? No, you'd be Jesus Christ. There'd be no need for a Savior if you were perfect. But we are being perfected until the day of our Lord's return. And that is the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit begins that work of transforming us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, into the image of our Savior. And that work will continue as long as you breathe your earthly breath. And there's a time when the Lord will return or call us back to himself where that work is going to be finished and it will be perfected. And we shall be like the one that we pursue. Acts 2 verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued steadfastly. This was an evidence of the work of the Spirit in them. They continued steadfastly, regularly, continuously in the apostles' doctrine because the apostles had all kinds of good things to say? Well, no. Because the apostles spoke that which became the word of God as they were inspired by the Holy Ghost. They kept the teaching of the scriptures. And fellowship. You know, someone gave a, a very good example once and you've probably heard this before, but you know when you have a lot of hot coals and you have them all together, they keep one another hot. But what happens if you take one of those red hot coals and you set it over here by itself away from the others? What happens to that coal? Well, it dies out. It doesn't stay hot. But there's an interesting thing that happens when you take that cold coal and you put it in the middle of all those hot coals. Eventually it starts glowing and gets red hot again. This is the importance of fellowship and why we need one another in the body of Christ. We don't get saved to become an island unto ourselves, to separate ourselves from everyone else. Okay, I'm saved, now just leave me alone. Absolutely not. The Lord redeems us and makes us a part of a community, of a family of faith. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, parted them to all men, and every man, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, with unity, praising God and having favor with all people. With all people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as should be saved. You know, this is a, a mark of Christianity in the world. Your witness to the world. They were praising God and they found favor with not just other redeemed people, but they found favor with all people. That's something about Christians being light 
and salt in the world. Light lights the way. Others know how and where to walk on account of the light of believers. Salt produces a thirst in others. What is it about you guys? What is it about you Christians? It's just something that's different about you. You know, they don't come out and say, Oh my, I know that you're a Christian. Tell me all about your Jesus, would you? That's not how they ask you. The world doesn't ask you that way. The world says, Why are you so weird? <laughs> that's what they ask. And what they're asking is, Tell me about Jesus. That's what it is. Well, they don't use those words. They use words like, Something, something's different about you. Why are you always so happy? Just, just something, something that's off. And I, I kind of like it. They're curious. They're curious. They're curious why it is that you can be a blessing around those others when they themselves are so miserable. What is the hope that you have found that they are longing for? This is the Holy Spirit at work within you. And others cannot help but see it. The entire world is blessed on account of the work of God in you. So let it show. Don't be afraid. There's a common thread that runs throughout each of the testimonies we're going to hear tonight. And that is that sin convicts and separates from God. That Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. And that the Holy Spirit begins the work of making us holy once we have come to Christ in faith. Now, that's enough chatter from me. Now we're going to hear from those who would like to be baptized. We're going to hear each testimony. I'm going to call the individuals up one at a time. When they come up and share their testimony after they've finished, they're going to make their way back and get changed. You'll have a seat here again after. Once everyone has shared their testimony, then we're going to get you wet and baptize you here. So that will be the process. We'll begin with Keenan Friesen. Would you come and share what the Lord has done for your soul? Yeah. Wow, and I thought this was going to be not nerve-wracking as much. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Keenan Friesen, and I grew up in a Christian home. And uh, when I was little, going to church was just boring to me, and I just wanted to get through it as quickly as I could. And... Um, I would rather go do something that would give me some pleasure or just make me feel good. But every time I would sin, I would feel so terrible and uh, just couldn't hold my sins in the dark any longer. So God told me to tell my parents and talk to my brothers and my youth leaders about my sins and instantly I would feel better. Uh, that's when I realized I was a lost sinner and, I, and couldn't help myself without God. Um, I, I found out that Jesus is the way, uh, the way to salvation by my parents telling me as I grew older. And although all through church, Sunday school, young teens, and youth, um, and I'm so grateful that I knew um, Jesus is the way to salvation because without knowing that, I'd be more lost than ever. Um, my life is so much easier now that I've come to come to the amazingness of God's word. I'm not say, saying I don't sin anymore because everyone sins, no one's perfect. And um, I have two Bible verses that have helped me drastically through my walk with God. Um, the first one is Mark 9, 23. Anything is possible for a person who believes. And uh, this verse just makes uh, me so joyful that anything is possible and that it is good to know that it is possible and so true that God will forgive me every time I sin. And also Joshua 1.9, um, I command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Uh, this verse encourages me to stay strong when times are hard or when I want to, or when I get tempted, because the Lord my God is with me wherever I go. God is so good and he has helped me so much. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Keenan. Uh, Keenan is going to be getting baptized. Um, and the first three testimonies will be those who um, 
would like to be baptized, James Harder, would you come and share what the Lord has done for your soul? Um, hello, my name is James Harder. I'm the son of P.D. and Trudy Harder. I'm here today to share my testimony. I grew up in a Christian home. I was taught right from wrong and how to love God. When I was about 12 years old, I realized I was a hopeless sinner and I needed saving. I asked God to come into my heart. Before that, I thought I could never be saved because I was too full of sin. So I stopped trying to be good. I fought with my siblings, argued with my parents. I got to fight at school. I didn't care about anything anymore. Weeks and time went by and I finally came to a point that I needed change and I needed a savior. I went to my room and knelt beside my bed and prayed. I told God I didn't deserve his forgiveness and I wanted to be a Christian, and so I did. I learned that Jesus provides sal salvation for everyone who seeks it. God changed my life like crazy. A verse that helped me is Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What better God is the God who would die for us even though we were still broken sinners? God says I'm a new creation in him. I'm going to let God continue to work in me. Thank you. Amen. And God is faithful to do just that. Natalie, would you come and share what the Lord has done for you? old. This is my testimony of how I got saved. One day we were folding laundry and my sister said that I wasn't saved. So I asked my mom and she said it was true. I told my mom I wanted to be saved. So we went into her room, we talked a little, and then we prayed. Now I know more of why I, I accepted God into my life. I realized that I was a sinner that needed to be cleansed from my sin. This is something to, there is always something to learn about him. The verse I really liked is Revelation 3, verse 20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. I really like this verse because it, it is saying God is standing at your door, waiting for you to open it, so that he can come in and have fellowship with you. Thank you all for listening to my testimony. So the next individuals that are going to be sharing their testimony, they're going to be baptized, and they've also requested to become members at the church here. So we'll begin with Curtis Friesen. You come and share what the Lord has done for you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Curtis Friesen, and I'm 16 years old. I was born and raised in a Christian home and was brought up always attending church, Sunday school, and now youth. Growing up, I was always taught that there was a God, and ever since I can remember, I believed it. I was saved at a very young age, not really knowing what it truly meant, and just doing it because I was told it was the right thing to do. However, one of the struggles I've gone through in the past is dealing with doubt. I would constantly have these thoughts sometimes in the middle of the night, just thinking, what if none of it's real, and really doubting that there was a God. But going to church and youth and being around fellow believers has really helped me get past this lie and start really trusting in God's word. In the past year or so, I've really started changing the way I live for God as I've started reading the Bible daily, praying daily, and I've turned away from my fleshly desires. I'm here tonight to take the next step in my walk with God by getting baptized and also becoming a member at Beacon Bible Chapel. Two verses that have really helped me in the past year are Hebrews 11 verse six, which is uh, end without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Thank you. Thanks, Curtis. 
Amy Bergen, would you come and share what the Lord has done for you? There's so much more people when you're actually standing up here. Hello everyone, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Amy Bergen. I'm 16 years old and I've been coming to this church for a bit over a year now. All of my life, I've had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home. We read Bible stories, prayed together, went to church regularly, but I didn't know God personally until last year. Last year, I was surrounded by people who were more so a negative influence on me. I completely lost faith and turned my back against God. Soon after, I started to think down on myself and also had suicidal thoughts. A couple weeks later, I got invited to come to this youth and little did I know I would meet the most amazing people ever. After putting it off for quite a while, I finally went and met such a special lady. Through her, I became closer with God and gained happiness in my life. Two months later, I went to the last baptism that happened here, and I got to witness something so powerful, so powerful words can't even describe it. That night, I gave my life to Christ, and ever since then, I've had an overwhelming amount of peace in my life. A verse that sticks out to me is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I find it comforting that I don't know what my future holds, but I know the one who holds it. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Amy. Larissa Simons, will you come and share what the Lord has done for you? Oh, there's a lot of people. I'm very nervous right now. Um, okay, so to start off with, you're not going to believe this, but I was raised in a Christian home. I know, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I don't really remember a time where I wouldn't have considered myself a Christian, even though I didn't really understand what it meant. Uh, growing up, my parents taught me all about the Bible, and I was memorizing and reciting scripture at a very young age. But at the time, that's all it was, um, saying the words with little thought to their deeper meaning. Of course, I was always told that I was a sinner in need of salvation and that Jesus had taken my place on the cross, but never, it never really sunk in until one day, fairly, recent, fairly recently actually, we were driving somewhere, and my mom was talking about how it's as though we were on death row, facing our execution, and Jesus stepped forward and took our place. And as I thought about it, I was just imagining the feeling of utter helplessness and fear facing impending doom, and then just the overwhelming relief of being spared. And I realized, wow, that was me. Um, sorry. I was there, and Jesus saved me. And even though I'd heard it a billion times, I guess it just hit differently that time. I still wouldn't be able to pinpoint an exact time where I would say, this is it. This is the moment I was born again. For me, it's been more of a gradual learning process as I begin to see and understand things in a way I never did before. And of course, I know I'm never going to have all the answers, and I'll never be perfect no matter how hard I try. I'll keep stumbling and making new mistakes. But I also know that God provides the way, and no matter how many times I fall, he will always be there to pick me up and set me back on my feet. So I've decided to put my faith in Jesus, put my life in his hands, and trust that he will always do what's best for me. A verse I'd like to share is Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a short verse, but it's a good one. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Larissa. David Zacharias, would you come and share what the Lord has done for you? Hello everyone, my name is David Zacharias and uh, I grew up with my parents teaching me about Jesus and I tried to follow their teachings but at some point I began to go my own way. I've heard about baptism a lot, never considered what it, what it was all about. And since I went to Beacon I learned a lot. I learned that I was convicted by the Holy Spirit that my life was wrong and full of sin and right, and right away I knew that Jesus was the only answer I needed. My favorite thing I've gotten out of everything is that prayer and putting your faith in Jesus can help you with any situation. I still have a lot of work to do, 
but I plan to involve Jesus in everything I do. I owe everything to him because he was kind to die for my sins, and for that I am grateful. Thank you. Tina Fair, would you come and share what the Lord has done for you? Hello, my name is Tina Fair. I grew up in a Christian home where I attended Old Colony. I was always taught what was right and what was wrong and what a person was supposed to do in order to be a good Christian and go to heaven. But when I was 12, I lost someone very close to me and a bit over a year later again. Watching someone you love so much pass away is hard. After the funerals, I didn't want to go back to that church. I stopped going for a while. I started making poor choices with my life and hung out with the wrong people until one day I got pretty sick and was in the hospital for a while. I didn't have anyone there with me. It, that gave me a lot of time to think about all the things that could go wrong. I knew if something happened to me, I might not go to heaven. But I remembered a video I watched of a girl who was in a similar, similar situation as I was, but she was saved. She was accepting of what God's plan was for her, and I knew I wanted that. I knew I had to change. I wanted to live my life for Christ, not knowing or live my life for Christ, not just knowing who he was. Um, since then, I've started hanging out with people that like talking about God and studying his word. Also, I started coming to church here and have grown a lot with my faith. Now I'm happy to go to church and hear what the preachers say, where before I would just go and not even pay attention. A Bible verse that has special meaning to me is Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not dismay, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. And lastly, we're going to have Anna Dyke come and share her testimony. She'd like to become a member at the church here. And uh, it's a very special situation. Uh, please come and share, Anna, what the Lord has done for you. Good evening, everybody. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone in this church. They have helped me through a lot. This was meant for both of us. But I guess God had different plans than we had. I'm so thankful for this church, how they have been. They have helped me. They have stayed behind me with prayers and with the meals. I'm just so thankful, and I, uh, I was raised and born, born in Mexico with a big family, my parents, but we never knew that there was a God. We never had school. It was not, not necessary. I didn't. Some of my siblings did, but I didn't. I couldn't read, I can't read. Well, I can read it now a little bit. I'm very thankful for that because God has helped me a lot. And uh, I know that Jesus Christ is first in my life and I was baptized when I was 17. That's when I accepted Jesus Christ because that's because of missionaries who came to Mexico and we kind of found ourselves through their Bible study, but they came to our house, and that meant so much. I'm just so thankful for missionaries, and I just want to let you know that I love this church, and I love you guys, the way you have accepted my husband when he was here. Cause he told me to uh, tell you that, that you accepted him who he was, not what he had done. He told me that on the way here to, that Sunday when we came to church to tell you guys if he couldn't. I think he knew that he wouldn't be able to. I miss him so terribly, but God is good. And he said he would do anything for me not to give up. He looked at me and he said, don't give up even if I can't. But I didn't know that he wouldn't come with me together. <laughs> but 
But I'm so thankful that God has everything in his hands and that he has different plans than we have. I would just ask that you would pray for me and I have a desire to become a member of this church. Even if my husband had a different plan than we both did. He told me that when we got to the church here, he looked at me and he says, tell the people how much I appreciate them. And I didn't know why he told me that. And then he said, don't give up. And then he threw himself in my arms and he was gone. But now I see what he meant all the way when we came to church. I think he told me about 10 times, don't give up, my dear. You're beautiful, you're my beautiful wife. I just want to thank you guys so much for everything. God is good all the time. And I have lots of Bible verses that I really, really like, but I won't really read them because that would take forever. Because <laughs> I read slow but I'm thankful that God has helped me that I can read. And I love him dearly. He's very near to me. And one more thing, I started praying a year ago for widows. It, it just came with my heart. I said, I need to pray for widows because they, they would be taken care of, not be, to be elected, neglected. You see it so many times. But I didn't know that I would be the next one. But God is good. I love you guys. And I just want to say we should have a lot of respect for our pastors because what they do to the people here from here, it seems different than when we sit in there. For the courage, what they have. Thank you. We want to rejoice with those who rejoice and we also grieve with those who grieve. And so we recognize your loss, Anna, certainly so. Uh, but we rejoice with Bill. And we, you know, he's been received into a membership we're longing for. And he just got there a little before us. But we're standing in line. Our time is coming. And we can rejoice. We don't need to be afraid. All right. Well, we've come to the time where we're going to begin with the baptisms, and we'll baptize these individuals in the same order. Uh, we've invited uh, those fathers who would like to to come and help with the baptism portion. So, uh, Keenan, would you come first, please? Rakeen, and I'm going to ask you the same question the, that Philip the Evangelist asked the Ethiopian eunuch when he baptized him. And that is this. Do you believe? Yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Kenan, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for Kenan. We pray that you would bless him that you would walk with him, fill him with your Holy Spirit, so that he might walk with you all the days of his life. Amen.
James, would you please come? Should have rolled my sleeves up before. Eh? <laughs> that, that's what it's for. I should have known. James, do you believe? Yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. James, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, our gracious Lord, thank you so much for James and the work that you have done in him. I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit so that James would walk with you all the days of his life. Amen. Natalie. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for Natalie. We pray that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit so that she might walk with you all the days of her life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Curtis. And Jake's going to join us again. This is like a double double, just the way you like the coffee. <laughs> Curtis, do you believe? Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Curtis, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for Curtis. We pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit and cause him to walk with you all the days of his life. Amen. <laughs> Amy Bergen. Amy, do you believe? Yes, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Amy, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for Amy. We pray that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit and cause her to walk with you all the days of her life. Amen. Larissa. Larissa, do you believe? Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is in Upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Gracious Lord, we thank you for Larissa. We pray that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit and cause her to walk with you all the days of her life. Amen. David. David, do you believe? Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. David, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, thank you for David. I pray that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit, that you would cause him to walk with you all the days of his life. Amen. Tina, do you believe? Yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Tina, upon the confession of faith that you have made, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, thank you for Tina. We pray that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit and cause her to walk with you all the days of her life. Amen. Well, that's all kinds of fun. <laughs> now we're going to have another song. And then we'll present these individuals with their baptism certificates uh, and bring about the closing after. Would you guys uh, stand with us? Thank you. 